First of all, I want to say thank you to Liberty University for all your prayers for our city. That was an awful night. Uh, we lost two congregants in our church. I happen to be a pastor of Calvary Chapel, Thousand Oaks, and I also happen to be the mayor of the city of Thousand Oaks. So I'm a pastor and a politician. Go figure. I, uh, my mom said growing up that you never talk about religion and politics in mixed company, so I'm the guy you don't invite to a dinner party. I was born and raised in California. I was born in 1964, and uh, California, yeah, I love it, love it. That's got to be my family. I was born in 64 in California. My dad was born in California. My grandfather was born in California. And uh, being a Calvary Chapel pastor, Calvary Chapel started in California in 1968. Pastor Chuck Smith broke away from the Four Square Churches in 1968 and started Calvary Chapel. And um, in 1968 in California, we had the fifth largest GDP, gross domestic production. And in addition to having the fifth largest GDP, we had the California Aqueduct, which was uh, a marvel of the world, and it allowed water to flow from the Sierras to the San Joaquin Valley, which the San Joaquin Valley is the breadbasket of America. We produce more cotton than the entire South combined. California was a state of the future. Reagan was governor in 68 when uh, Chuck started the Calvary Chapel movement. And it was an amazing place to grow up. Well, what Chuck in 1968 decided to do when he broke away from the four square churches is uh, he looked out at a sea of humanity, and much like uh, our Generation X and our Millennials that had kind of been disillusioned with politics. And the reason why, for those of you who remember 1968, uh, Bobby Kennedy was shot in Los Angeles running for president. Martin Luther King Jr. was shot on the balcony of a hotel in Memphis, Tennessee. John F. Kennedy had been shot in 63. In 68, we had the My Lai Massacre with Vietnam. The following year, there'd be the Kent State shooting. The nation was being torn apart and was being ripped apart, and it was a, a tough time to be an American in 1968. That year would conclude with the Apollo capsule orbiting the Earth, and the astronauts would read from Genesis, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the Earth. They would be sued by Madeleine Murray O'Hare saying that a, a, a government capsule wasn't permitted to preach religious messages. She lost that. Uh, she'd probably win today, but she lost it back then. And the nation in turmoil, Chuck looks out at the sea of humanity of all these kids that had checked out of the church and had gone after Eastern religions and started kind of experimenting with every type of drug imaginable. And he and his wife Kay, their heart was broken, and they began to minister on the shores of California with all these kids that had been washed up for the most part on the shores of California, disillusioned and struggling. And he decided to be apolitical because all these kids had been uh, just disillusioned with politics, so he just simply stuck to the gospel, teaching the Bible verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. As a result of this, Calvary chapels have had a 10,000 percent growth since 1968. There's over 1,800 Calvary chapels around the world. And in California alone, south of Van Nuys, which is Southern California, down to San Diego, there's over 350 Calvary chapels. Calvary chapels are responsible for the Harvest Crusades with Greg Laurie. Two of the ten largest churches in America are Calvary chapels. It was an amazing move of God's Spirit upon uh, the state of California, but we were apolitical. And I want you to pay attention. We were apolitical. We believe that there's a separation church and state. We didn't want to dirty ourselves with politics, so we stayed out of politics and just stayed to the gospel. And we hear that from the pulpits in America today, that politics is dirty. I've spoken to over 20,000 pastors across the country. I hear that all the time. Politics is dirty. My response is, so the, so's the church. What's your point? And they also say, I'm tired of voting for the lesser of two evils. And I say, listen, unless Jesus Christ is running for office, you'll always be voting for the lesser of two evils. Come up with a better excuse. But because Calvary chapels were apolitical for 50 years, 10,000 percent growth, and now that's not, that's not transfer growth, that's conversion growth, because I preach the gospel every Sunday. I preach the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you believe in your heart, confess with your, your, your tongue that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved to the glory of the Father. Raise your hand. People raise their hand. God bless you. I see your hand. I do that every Sunday. So don't accuse me of not preaching the gospel because I'm political. It doesn't fly. And that being said, we stayed out of politics. 10,000 percent conversion growth, but what was the result of 50 years of doing that in California? Because as, I'm, as I understand, the gospel is supposed to transform culture. 
So with 10,000% growth over 50 years, here we are in 2019, how has Calvary Chapel affected the state of California by being apolitical but preaching the gospel? Well, we no longer have the fifth largest GDP. We now have the sixth, maybe seventh. We have the highest debt of any state in the union. You combine the next four largest states' debt, it doesn't equal the debt of California. We lead the nation in poverty. We have the highest gas tax, sales tax, income tax, and corporate tax. We're the authors of no-fault divorce that Reagan signed into law in 70. He said it was the worst legislation he ever signed, and it, created, it decimated marriage across the country. We're the authors of no-fault divorce, transgender bathroom bills, and here's the kicker. We lead the nation in abortion. We've aborted more children in California than the entire population of Canada. Where's the power of the gospel? And for those of you who think the church isn't supposed to engage in politics, politely, I want to firmly disagree with you. You see, one of the greatest miracles in the Bible is when the children of Israel are led out of slavery, out of bondage. And they go through the Red Sea. God causes Pharaoh's army to drown in the Red Sea. These are all slaves. They have no military power whatsoever. They're delivered from bondage into freedom, and they end up in the wilderness, which is a kind way of saying a desert where there's no water or food. And God, for 40 years, miraculously feeds them 40 tons of food a day. That's a logistic nightmare to feed three to five million people, and water would would be produced where there was no water. Quail would be blown off course so they'd have meat coming out their nostrils. They'd eat so much. Their clothes didn't wear out and their shoes didn't wear out. You can read the Scripture on your own and see that. But that's not the greatest miracle. The greatest miracle is that three to five million people live together for 40 years without a police force and a standing army. Why? Because Moses got a downloaded app on Mount Sinai. And that downloaded app was a moral app. And as Dallas Willard, who just passed away with cancer, who was a wonderful professor at USC, said, there's a disappearance of moral knowledge in the latest book that he put forward. It's his magnum opus, and it's a remarkable book. You need to read it. This disappearance of moral knowledge that caused three to five million people to dwell together in a representative form of government long before there was a monarchy because that it was said to Moses, appoint godly men who are not covetous over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens, federal, state, county, local. You read Isaiah 45, and it says that God is our king, our lawgiver, and our judge. There you have the executive, legislative, and judicial branch. We got it all from the Bible, folks. And this experiment in representative government came from the Scriptures. And these folks dwelt together without a standing army or a police force because they had a downloaded moral app, which is what you receive here at Liberty University, and it's a remarkable gift from the Lord. Now that being said. I looked out at California that I had been a part of my entire life, my father had been a part of his entire life, and my grandfather. And we're watching a state that's imploding. I am a California condor. I'm an endangered species. I'm a conservative in California. Except for condors are protected. You're supposed to laugh at this, folks. Work with me here. I'm not giving away a car, but you can still laugh at what's funny. And at this point, when you look at California, I would get my congregation, I'd try to get them registered to vote, I'd, tell a, I'd preach a sermon, and, and then we'd go and we'd, we'd vote, and everything we'd vote for would lose. Now I can't take people where I'm not willing to go myself, so I decided to do something that all the pastors told me not to do. I decided, strangely enough, to run for office. I didn't know my elbow from my earlobe when it came to running for office, and there was an assemblywoman from Bakersfield, and I was on a trip to Israel with Governor Rick Perry, I was a teaching pastor. She befriended me on this trip, and she said, you need to run for office because you know history, and you know who your your office holders are in your county. And I said, you know what? My father and my mother instilled that in me. I wasn't raised in a Christian home, but they were very politically active. My father was president of the Rotary. My mother was president of Republican Women. My dad was a president of the Chamber of Commerce. My father had three tours of Vietnam. He ran for city council twice. I walked precincts with my mother. I I met Reagan when I was either 10 or 11. He was promoting a book, and I remember he signed the book. He said, best wishes, Robert McCoy, Ronald Reagan. He rubbed my head, gave me his autograph. What he didn't realize back then was that he was endorsing me today, but that's neither here nor there. And so I watched my parents engage. Now, I never read the Bible with my parents. I never prayed with my parents, but they were God-fearing in one sense that they lived this downloaded moral app with their lives. They didn't lie, and they, they were honest in their business dealings, but they weren't churchgoers. And as a result, they instilled in me my civic responsibility to protect this constitutional republic. And so when I stepped into the pulpit and I saw this apathy, 
I didn't understand it, especially in the Calvary chapels. So Shannon Grove tells me to run for office, and I decide to run for office uh, for the lower house of, of the California State uh, Legislature, for the State Assembly. And it was a really tough race. I was, there was three Republicans, one Democrat. Two of the Republicans pulled out of the, out of the race, and there was just me and the Democrat left. I had raised about $80,000. I called everybody I knew, my grandmother, my grandfather, they were all dead. I still called them. And I called everybody I could to try to get money. Had I known you, I would have called you. And I raised $80,000, and it was time to run into this primary and, and to, to skate into the general election. But the California Republican Party didn't want a white evangelical running in a primarily Democrat district. It was plus 21 Democrat in Oxnard in a large uh, Latino population. And, and as a result, they put forward a 26-year-old Hispanic by the name of Mario de la Piedra, a really nice guy. We became friends, but they gave him a million dollars in the primary to run against me. Now, I'd been a Republican longer than I'd been a Christian, a husband, a father, a pastor. This is my party. I'd walk precincts. I knew Reagan. He, he endorsed me. And they spent a million dollars against me in a primary, and I beat, I beat their candidate. Yeah, you can clap for that. It was hard work. Now, we go into the general election, and the chairman of the California Republican Party, Jim Brulte, was a pragmatic man. They were going to abandon the seat because they didn't want to support an evangelical. And Jim thought that they could win the seat, and so he said, we're going to support the good pastor. We'll give him a million dollars. But they had one, one requirement. And that requirement was that they got to assign the campaign manager for our campaign. So I got together with our campaign and I said, listen, they're going to give us a million dollars. At that point, we'd raised 800,000. They're going to give us a million dollars, but we have to allow them to assign a campaign manager. Well, the staff said, that's fine. We'll still, still do what we do, but go ahead and allow that. So we did. This young guy from Berkeley shows up. He's their crack candidate uh, to, to be the, the campaign manager. His name's Ryan Hatcher. He's not a church-going guy. He's not a Christian. He shows up at the campaign, and he starts doing his magic. And within six weeks, interestingly enough, one of our volunteers leads him to Christ, and he's one of my best friends walking with the Lord today. So, I ended up losing that race by 4,000 votes and over 100,000 casts. The Democrats spent $6.3 million against me, which was more than 80% of any of the other races in the United States. And that was for a lower house state seat, which was remarkable. But I cut my teeth in politics and I started to understand it and I was so tired. And I remember that night, Wednesday night, or actually Wednesday morning after the election on Tuesday night, and I was just saying, God, this is so hard. And the team called me because the woman who had beaten me was a sitting city council member. She went on to the assembly and her seat was vacated. And my staff came to me and said, you need to run for her vacated city council seat. And I said, I'm tired, I can't do it. And they said, you've got to. So I ran one more campaign that was exhausting and I put everything I had into it and everybody walked. We had 650 volunteers. It was the largest grassroots campaign in, in 20 years in California politics. They were excited. People said that if you ran for office that the, the attendance in your church would drop and so would your tithing. Yeah, it did. But you know what happened? After those people left, we did 150 coffees in homes of people that would never darken the doors of the church and they started to come to church because they were looking for someone to lead them. And all of a sudden, the church started to explode. And amazing things started to happen in the community and these people started to walk for something bigger than themselves. And on election night, I was losing by about 170 votes, and one man who had had a stroke who said, if God heals me, I'm going to make phone calls for you. God healed him. He made 20,000 phone calls for me, and he told me, you're not going to lose this election. I said, how do you know? And his name's Tom Hunt, and he said, I made 1,200 phone calls for you tonight, and they said they're all going to vote for you. The next day, I won by 52 votes. Now, you know what you call a guy who wins by 52 votes? The winner. I won re-election by over 4,000 votes, and today as I stand before you, I am the mayor of the city of Thousand Oaks that has gone through a trial unlike most of the cities in this country. And God has strategically allowed me to be an instrument to comfort people. And for those of you who don't think Christians belong in politics, I hope to dispel that myth. You know, thank you, I appreciate that. You know, we struggle with LGBTQ, we struggle with immigration, we have all these issues, and for young people, you tend to be influenced 
by this idea of wanting to be loving and compassionate. Well, I want to tell you as I sit in office holding conservative ideals, I am compassionate. There was a bill, Assembly Bill AB 2943, that said that you can't counsel someone out of a same-sex attraction, and most of our psychologists and psychiatrists were going to lose their practice who counseled people who wanted to come out of a same-sex attraction because they were no longer permitted under this bill to do that. The author of that bill was a man by the name of Evan Lowe, a self-professing homosexual assembly member, and he had put this bill forward. Our assemblywoman, Jackie Irwin, who I ran against in that campaign, and I treated her with civility, and we became friends as a result. I called her and I said, would you at least abstain or vote no? And she said, I can't because one of my best friends is homosexual, one of our staff members is a homosexual, and I'm voting yes, but you should talk to Evan Lowe. And I said, Jackie, my sister's a lesbian. I, I, that, that has nothing to do with the violation of the First Amendment of this bill. And she said, but would you talk with Evan? I said, of course I will. And I flew up to Sacramento on my own dime. I sat with him, a very kind man. The two of us sat together and I said, Assemblyman Lowe, you guys dominate the executive, legislative, and judicial branch. You have the highest supermajority ever in the history of California. You could do anything you wanted to do. You're going to win at the state level, but you're going to lose at the federal level. You'll be a hero at the state level, and you're going to lose at the federal level. But the one thing I want to tell you is, I understand as an assemblyman, excuse me, I understand that when you were the mayor of Campbell, when you were the mayor of Campbell, that you could officiate um, an Eagle Scout pinning of, of an Eagle Scout as the mayor, but you couldn't be in Boy Scouts as a gay male. You could host a blood drive, but you couldn't give blood as a gay male. You could officiate a wedding, but you couldn't be married as a gay male. I understand all that, and I understand what drives you and the why for what you do. But understand this, this doesn't need to happen at the expense of the First Amendment, and that's what's occurring. And so I said, why don't you come and meet some folks and step outside your echo chamber and come to our church, you'll be warmly received. He said, are you sure? And he actually asked a couple of questions of some of the assembly members that knew me, and they all assured him the church will, will be very kind to you. Well, a great credit to Evan Lowe. He came to our church. He came on a Tuesday. We didn't have a service because we have him on Wednesdays and Sundays. He came, and I sat him down with a room full of Hispanic pastors, black pastors, and two psychologists. And these black and Hispanic pastors represented a large swath of the Democratic Party who had come together in unity with me against AB 2943. And I looked at Evan because there's one currency in politics, and that's winning elections. And as he sat down and I understood his currency, I said to Evan, you have done something that I haven't been able to do in 10 years. You've united these folks behind uh, me, and, and we want to come against you. Because you want to violate our First Amendment rights, we understand what you want to accomplish, but we need to communicate together and work through this. He was moved by, by the assets we had put at the table. And these folks shared with him how much it just in, in, it was in, infuriating to them but they did it lovingly. Well, he had gotten passed by the assembly and by the Senate, and all it needed was a governor's signature, and to credit to Evan Lowe, he pulled that bill because he was moved by that meeting. That's the power that you can have when you work in a civil manner within politics. I've got two stories, and I'll leave you be. I, 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 uh, I want you to understand this idea with the immigration issue. You know, I've been heavily influenced, especially in California, and we see this idea of building a wall. When I was 11 years old, my father, a Navy captain, in 1975 said, son, get in the car. We lived in Coronado, California, and I got in the car and I didn't know what we were doing, and we drove north to Camp Pendleton, a Marine Corps base near Oceanside, California. He was very mysterious and he didn't seem to be communicating with me. We drive through the gate with a crisp salute from an enlisted Marine to my Navy captain officer father. They directed us, and when we got to this location at Camp Pendleton, there was a sea of tents as far as the eye could see. We got to the front section of where these tents were. Another Marine crisply saluted my father. He looked through a series of files. He said, uh, Major Nguyen is located in this tent. My father and I walked through this tent city. We came up to the tent that was on the card. Major Nguyen came out with his brand new bride. He saluted my father. My father said, there's no time for saluting. Let's get in the car. We're going to head home. My dad said, Rob, I want you to meet your new brother and your new sister. You see, Vietnam, South Vietnam had fallen, and these folks didn't have a country anymore. Newly married to Mrs. Nguyen, she was from a rural village in Vietnam, and we got in the car. She didn't speak any English. Major Nguyen did. We got to the house, and my mother was meticulous housekeeper. She would vacuum the floor, and she'd leave lines in the carpet, and you weren't allowed to make tracks. You had to fly from one room to the next. 
and they had just remodeled the kitchen, and my mother hated the smell of fried food and fish she wouldn't tolerate in the house. And of course, the first night, Mrs. Nguyen is frying fish in the frying pan. And all of a sudden, it catches fire. And in a rural village, when your frying pan catches fire, you throw it down into the dirt. Mrs. Nguyen threw it down into the new carpet, and it caught fire, and we put it out. And I thought, oh, you're going to be dead. And strangely enough, my mom and dad have passed. But strangely enough, my mom didn't say anything. And I was confused. I took her aside and I said, Mom, they just burned your new carpet. I'll never forget what she said. She said, Rob, they just lost their country. They came here for freedom. We can replace the carpet. That's the way you do it right in America. Currently with the Lanes and myself, we are taking care of a family, political refugees from Colombia, the Gallo family. We've been taking care of them. We got their son in a school. We've got them all situated. We want to do it right because we have borders and compacts and we the people want to protect this institution of liberty for all the world to know. And that being said, I'll leave you with this last story and it's one that blesses me. You see, when I ran for office, I got beat up. I got death threats. They sent us hate mail. People would follow you. It was the hardest thing I ever did. And when the Bible says that you're going to be persecuted, and blessed are you when you're persecuted and reviled for my name's sake, for great is your reward in heaven. I'd been behind that pulpit for 20 years, and I'd never experienced that. It wasn't until I stepped out of the pulpit into politics that I faced that. And when I stepped out into the political arena and I ran for office, you get real bitter because, first of all, the pastors won't even bring you in to pray for you because they're apolitical. And secondly, the, the people that are your opponents are very vicious. And God showed me something. He said, Rob, people are not the enemy, they're the opportunity. A missionary goes where he's not loved but needed, and he leaves when he's no longer needed but he's loved. And I began to love on these folks and minister to them. And I started to see a person on the council who's ideologically opposed to me become one of my dearest friends. I can say that Jackie Irwin's my friend, Evan Lowe is my friend. I may disagree with them fervently, but I, I do not disrespect them. Because I may have a different ideology, it doesn't allow me to attack them personally. And we contend for issues. And what I found was this, on that awful night the Tuesday night when I had put my heart and soul into this last election and the Democrats mopped the floor with us and everyone I voted for got beat and it was one of the worst elections, we got beat up real bad. I had to call folks that I'd been encouraging and I was up that whole night and I was tired. And I'd been laboring and my wife and I had set 10% of our income aside beyond what we tithe and we give, we set 10% aside to invest in candidates. You want a godly government but you're not willing to do squat to get it. You walk precincts and you donate fervently and you help. We just expect it to happen, but the folks that run for office get the daylights beaten out of them. You host coffees, you put out yard signs. We did that and we were hurting that night. We went into Wednesday and I didn't get any sleep and then Wednesday night I taught the sermon and then I was so tired and I came back at 11.30 that night and I put my head on, a, on the pillow for a much needed rest and I was asleep for about 40 minutes when there was a knock at the sliding glass window and my daughter said, Dad, you gotta wake up the police scanner. There's been a shooting at the borderline. I got up and I saw that there was text messages from the police chief and also from the city manager and I went down to the command center and that night as these kids had rabbited out. One gunman went in and killed 12 of our citizens. Two of them were from our congregation. Two boys, one served in our special needs ministry, a Marine. He shot him, lost another boy. His parents are in church every Sunday with their heart broken and so are his grandparents. And that night when that shooting had occurred, the family started to show up because they couldn't get an answer on the phone from their child. And we dispersed, and I was going back, and we had set up a center for them to go and, and see if their children were one of the victims at the Alex Fiore Teen Center. And as I was driving back, God said, turn around and go back. And I went back, and I stayed the whole night with them. I was up 60 hours with these families, seven of them I was with, when they were notified that their children were one of the victims. We buried all 12 of them. 
And the comfort they received in the midst of that is exactly what God wants because good government only happens with good people. And you young folks here at Liberty, uh, Generation X and the millennial generation, okay, but I'm looking at Generation Z, let's light it up. Let's start getting you people involved so good government happens with good people and start having a vision for a nation that will protect the liberties of future generations so you can plant seeds of trees whose shade you'll never know. Being in office and 54 years of living on this earth is the hardest thing I've ever done. And I'd do it again and again and again. Folks, encourage your congregations to get engaged. Last thing, there are 15 million self-professing evangelical Christians in California. 7,280,000 of them are not registered to vote. Of the half that are registered, only half of those vote in a presidential election and 12% vote in a non-presidential election. And the pulpits are silent. Cause your pastors to awaken that we must instill this downloaded moral app and cause this nation to rise once again for the glory of God. God bless you and thank you for your time. <laughs>